Hi, my name is Kat, or the Fairy Librarian, and welcome back to a new video. Today, I would like to do something slightly different than what I've done before, um, because at the beginning of February, I finished a non-fiction book called No Escape by Nuri Turkel, Turkel, Turkel. Um, about the genocide of the Uyghurs in China and the book really stuck with me and so I just wanted to make a video um, talking about it and talk about what I learned, my takeaways from the book. Um, also I'll give you just my thoughts as a review um, at the end of the video. Um, just discussing the book. Um, also, I looked up the pronunciation of Uyghur, and this is why that are what I found. But in Dutch, we say Uyghur, which kind of goes with English spelling. So I thought for a very long time that that was the right pronunciation. Um, so apparently it's not. So I just want to apologize in advance if I say Uyghur instead of Uyghur at some point. Um, um, I have the just the names of the chapters um, right here in front of me, but other than that I didn't take any notes or something. I didn't script this video. I'm just gonna wing it and we'll see where we're going. So this will not be a perfect summary of the book or anything. Just what did I personally learn? What did I personally remember? What did I think is was the most interesting? Whatever. Um, so that's what this is. Um, so the book has eight parts um, plus a prologue and an epilogue. Um, in the prologue. Um, one other thing that he says there is that the Uyghurs call their region East Turkestan, but the Han Chinese call it Xinjiang. I should have looked at that pronunciation before I started filming. Hang on, Xinjiang, apparently. Um, so the author uses that name just for the sake of consistency. Um, so I will also do that throughout this video. Um, so that's what I want to say about the prologue because it's the prologue. Um, then we have the student and the lawyer, which sort of are a memoir. So the student is his time living in China and then the lawyer is his time living in the US um, where he is an advocate for Uyghur rights. Um, I personally didn't, I, I don't like a memoirs. It's not my genre, so this is not, I'm not gonna spend too much time on this part. I, it does start off with quite a, um, a hard, bit um, where it talks about how he's born and how he's born in a um, internment camp. Um, and, and yeah, the things that happened there, which were really tough. And then in The Lawyer, he talks about his time as an advocate and also maybe people who were able to escape China, um, but had to have left their family behind. And then how how that is um, that our families are still in danger, and how if they're able to contact their family 
they see how um, how the the Chinese government is still putting a hold on them and how um, yeah it's just it's really hard especially if it's their children um, that have been taken away by them and just not recognizing their own parents and just I don't know that that, that was um, that must have been extremely or must be extremely hard for the parents because it's still um, a thing that's going on today uh, which was the whole thing with this book I can read about relatively dark things while being fine but just knowing that all of this has really happened and is still going on today made it so hard to read and so emotional for me which is why it took me so long I started in October I think and I finished it in early February just because I needed a break um, in between. I couldn't read a lot of it at once. It was so heart-wrenching. Um, but so those are the things I wanted to talk about with the first two parts because as I said, I just personally am not that interested in um, memoir. Then comes the longest and most gut-wrenching part that I probably gotta spend a bit more time on which is the war on Uyghur women um this tells the story of three um, women can I remember do I remember their names oh Zumrat Kelbinur and Mirigu, I think. I sorry if I pronounce them correct incorrectly. Um, I sorry, <laughs> um, but um, those were the three women, and just their story was really. Their stories were really really hard to read. Um, so, Gelbinur is a Mandarin teacher, um, and when schools weren't allowed to teach Uyghur kids in their native language anymore, um, her job became kind of redundant because every, because all the classes were in Mandarin, so why would I need to learn Mandarin separately. Um, so she was forced to teach uh, Mandarin to the Uyghurs in the re-education camps. Um, and so just some observations that she did there were really hard, especially knowing the background <clears throat> um, from the other two stories. That was really um, heartbreaking. Um, but the most, like the worst part or the most gut-wrenching part in isolation for her story was um, the birth control because the China has heavy birth control regulations um, for everyone 
um, or have them for everyone. I guess they still do. Um, but there were some really specific ones for um, Uyghurs. So Uyghurs were allowed to have two children, but there have there need to be three years between the two. So um, there was one like short part about a woman. I don't think it was one of the three. Was I think it was the fourth one. Um, who her husband died while she was pregnant. But then there was her second child, and the three years hadn't have passed between the like since her first child was born, um, she was forced to have an abortion, um, and yeah, it was. I don't know. It was, it's, it's so, I just don't even know how to say that, I like what to say, aside from just so gut-wrenching and, and hard to read, um, but Galbinod was already older, her children were adults, they left the house, she was just living there with her husband, um, then suddenly there was a law passed where all Uyghur women under the age of 50 who have had two children need a certain thing implanted in their vagina that would prevent them from having children. And Kelbinud was 49. Um, to do like, as if I would have another child, um, this makes no sense, but, um, no mercy, they, she had to have it would hurt like crazy, um, until she found a willing doctor to remove it, um, and then, um, so she was, yeah, because she was about to turn 50 um so then the law wouldn't apply to her anymore so at least she would be safe um other women not but she would um but then right after she turned 50 a new law was passed that all women under the age of 55 who'd have had two children needed to be sterilized and the sterilization wasn't really done with a lot of respect to the women and she just tells how she's been bleeding um, and was non-stop for days after it happened and so I um <clears throat> that kind of leads us to um, another story um, because this birth control thing and sort of forced sterilization um, wasn't just done like that in the law but also um we have one of the other women zumrat who had um who was incarcerated for some stupid reason um and um she was forced to take a certain pill every day as were the other women in the prison where she was. Um, and no one really told her 
or taught them what it was. They just forced them to take it every day. Um, and sometimes women would be brought in for also bleeding from their vagina, so they would have the same sterilization as Kilgan would have had. Um, but later on, when Zumarata then escaped, because um, the three women all escaped, which is how we know their stories, um, she got tested and she was now unable to get children. Um, and she, like, it's almost certain that it's because of what they gave her there. Um, so... And then, um, another thing with the child control, that Mirigul, who had moved to Egypt, I believe. I think this was her story. I, I think it was, anyway, I might be mixing up two women but i don't think i am and when she moved to egypt where she had married a uyghur man but it was more a marriage of convenience type thing because she actually had a relationship with an arab man um and her husband knew that and Like they had an agreement that she was allowed to do that. It was it was purely a marriage of convenience. Um, and then at some point she got pregnant and got children. And on the birth certificate, as a father, she had put the name of this Arab man that she was in love with, and not her weaker husband. Um, which is going to become important. Um, but look, that I know is someone else, but then there's a part that I'm not sure if it's her or if it's someone else, but she had returned to China to visit her family, um, taking her kids with her, her three kids. Um, but there she was arrested and taken to one of the camps. Um, um and, and sentenced to death almost even until um she could prove that the children were in fact children of a Egyptian, I believe, citizen. I think that was the um the man she had a relationship, I think, was Egyptian. I might be wrong. Um, and not a weaker man. And so because of that, she was released and reunited with her children. But only two of them, because she was at, you have to go to the hospital um, right now. And um, there they told her that one of her children had died. Um... And she was confused because, uh, well, not really confused. She was surprised because uh, the child was healthy and everything. And she wasn't allowed to see the body. And so well, probably the Chinese authorities just killed her child because she had one too many. Um, and they um, <clears throat> they wanted to take away her children to have them be raised by Han Chinese. Um, 
outside of Xinjiang um, so they would have a proper education and they raise this proper Chinese citizens um, so yeah that was really really hard um, to read um, another thing it's the war on women so sexual violence is obviously also a thing um, within the prisons or the, the the camps but also outside of that because at a certain point every family had gotten a Han Chinese um, like assigned to them who would live in their house and basically spy on them and they call it their becoming family um and so they were forced to be nice to them and to um, receive them gratefully and give them food and, and, and a place to to sleep and whatever um and not just a place to sleep they would often sleep in the same bedroom as people um, of the family and it wasn't a rare thing that they Whenever they were alone with a woman in the house, um, they would. Which was not an unusual thing. Um, so... Um, <clears throat> that was also a thing that went on, I think. Um, I'm gonna move on to the next part because it's not all that happened in here but it's just awful awful things and really just uh, I, I have no words honestly this part was the was so hard to read. This was the hardest part, also the longest part. Um, but just knowing that all of this is still happening on a daily basis. Breaks my heart and makes me so mad. Um, but we're gonna get to that. Um, so I'll just move on to part four, um, which the rest are still hard to read, but it's, it's, yeah. Um, part four um, is how to delete a culture. Um, there they talk about how in China, atheism is the norm and that one is sometimes forcibly um, enforced um, and so they started with hanging cameras with facial recognition at the entrance of mosques and other religious places um, So that if you visit them on a regular basis, 
you could be accused of Muslim extremism and be arrested and sent to the camps because anything that would vaguely show that you're a devout religious person, um, in this case, Muslim, because Uyghurs are Muslim, but I don't know how other um, religious groups are are treated, but I assume that similar things go for those. Um, but if you show that you're a, at least vaguely devout Muslim, um, you would be accused of being a Muslim terrorist and locked up. Um, even I talked about the becoming family. Um, if a girl's skirt was too long, then why are they covering up? Um, is that out of religious intentions? Um, or what's the deal with that? If a man would let their beard grow, um, that's a thing that Muslim terrorists do and things would just go very far um, so they just want to beat out the religion out of the the population basically um, there was one passage as well where um, Um, one person mentioned how they would get something to eat in um, the prison and they weren't sure what it was but that he was convinced that it was pork to see if they would eat it or not um, and also every day they had to um, reject the religion and their god um, day in day out um, and just any vague reference to something religious would be seen as extremism and you're accused of being a terrorist um, so that must have been really hard and I one of the things that I did um, like was how the author mentioned that they're being dumb about it or trying to be dumb about it because the more they um, mistreat these people the more they're going to turn to their faith to find solace um and so what they're doing isn't working um and that's sort of the the moral of these things they're not they're not even effective ways of achieving their goal they're just torturing these people It's, yeah, it's really, I, I feel like I have a lot of unfinished sentences, but I just don't know how to, how to even express um, how I'm feeling. So, so I'm also jumping um, from one thing to another. I'm not very structured in this video. Um, again, I apologize, but I just don't even know how to properly express what I'm feeling, um, so, yeah, um, there was also in this part a, 
um, if someone who knew how to use Google Maps and how to see satellite images or Google Earth to see satellite images um, throughout the years and he compared um, satellite images of religious sites and buildings, so mosques or whatever, um, from before this thing to what the place looks like now. And so many of them, like almost all of them really, have been destroyed or secularized or whatever. They're just not there anymore like they used to. Um, so they're just really trying to delete their culture as the as the title says um, if they can't speak their own language anymore um, as I said before their schools weren't allowed to teach in the Uyghur language anymore even though um, That actually is not illegal, according to the law, but if you do that, um, you would be accused of separatism. Um, because most of these things aren't even actual laws, they're just... They're not actually forbidden, they're just used to pin an actual crime onto you. And even if they can't find anything, they'll just pin something onto you. There was one part where, I don't know if it was here or before or after, I don't know. But there was one story about a person who had uh, been arrested and kept in this room where they were interrogated for hours and hours and hours on end. And at the end, they just said, you know what? Tell me to com what I need to confess to, and I'll confess to it. And then at least I'm out of this I'm out of this room, um, because I know that the police never would have let them go, um, because they were Uyghur. Um, so at least they could. shorten um, the amount of time um, and that brings us also to the next part which is the reinvention of, gen of genocide that there was a very um, interesting discussion going on on that the name of what this would be called really mattered because officially crimes against humanity, genocide, a few other things are like none none of them is 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 lighter than another. Um but um in the perception genocide sounds a lot worse than crimes against humanity and so just the fear that it would be called something else was really um was really there for the author um not necessarily for the legal like the actual legal um consequences of it which is for public perception um, and so when we have the American definition of genocide, because every country has their own definition of when something, um, 
is seen as a certain crime because it's just the law and every country has different laws, obviously. Um, but according to the American definition of genocide, this really is one. Um, even though there aren't the mass killings that are often associated with it, it still ticks all the boxes to be a genocide. And so that was really important to him that it would officially be called that. Um, so that was very interesting as well. Um, like the birth controls, the deleting of the culture that I that we mentioned, um, there are clear indications of, no, it is in fact genocide, not just crimes against humanity or whatever. Um, so that was really um, interesting and it was I, I was glad that that part was in there because it was more of a political, how do we call this thing? And just for one short bit, not stories of what was going on. So it was just slightly less anger inducing and slightly less heartbreaking, um, which was much needed. Um, which, now that I've said it, may sound insensitive or like I have no heart. Um, because obviously the people in the actual situation can't just take a break like that. Um, so I'm sorry if it comes across that way. Um, but I, I just trying to say that It was just so hard to get through this book, as I've said already many times in this video. So it was nice to just be able to, to breathe for a second. And then we have part number six, which um, is called A Message of a Slave, um, which is about forced labor, so basically slavery in Xinjiang. Um, so the people in the um, re-education camps are forced to work um, for things. So a lot of the made in China type things are actually made using forced Uyghur labor. Um, so, for example, most well, the odds of if you buy something made out of cotton that that cotton is sourced in Xinjiang is fairly high. Um, and also, one thing that really has sparked something that um, was also just. Um, so, solar panels require certain parts, and those parts are made with Uyghur labor, and there used to be different companies in different countries, but because the Chinese version was so much cheaper because they were produced using slavery, um, the other companies went out of business. So today, if you want to make a solar panel, you have to purchase these materials or these parts from China, from forced labor. Um, so that was the thing. Basically, China is saying either you 
try and save the planet because global warming and then you look the other way about the way these things are produced or you go against us but then you're also damning the planet with your fossil fuel and your or sort of fossil energy um, and just forcing that choice upon countries um which how how do you make that choice and when you have made it if you choose for human rights how are you gonna get like how are you gonna sell that decision to the people because global warming is a thing that is so that everyone is just so aware about and, and is so widely talked about and we need to do something about this but this is going on very much under the radar of many people like before reading this book i knew that this was an issue but i never could have imagined the extent to which this was happening so if before reading this book and not knowing what I know now, if they would have come to me and said, like, we're not going to do solar panels anymore in this country because human rights, I would have been mad. And I like a lot of people would be, I, I can imagine, um, So it's 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 this dilemma of what do you do? Um so that was also um a very interesting discussion and I don't know how to if part of me is like of course you you choose human rights but then also it's not that easy i don't i don't know how how to feel about this issue um so and there were more um things like this um that's just yeah what, what can we do um China has made it so that they have a tight grip on everyone, basically, so that no one is now able to stop them. So what do we do? Um, both as just as the people, as the politicians leading the country, I, I, I don't know. Um, then oh, the seventh part is the digital dictatorship, um, which is about the surveillance cameras who can, like China's being watched constantly, which enables them to arrest those people by just making a mark. Um, so, and also on top of just being watched and the government just listening in on your conversations 24-7, Uyghurs are also forced to spy on each other. So they would say to person A, okay. You're gonna watch person B, and every week I want a full report of what they've been doing and any suspicious business that they've been doing. Um, but you never know if there's someone else who's also supposed to watch the same person, and you never know what the cameras have picked up, so you can't really lie because that brings yourself in danger. But also, do you really want to bring this other person in danger? So what do you do? That, that, that's always the thing. 
what do you do they have such a fourth hold on everything and it's it's just it's so hard because i don't know what i would do And then in that situation, I would just do what they tell me to do because I'm I'm too scared to do something else, which is probably what a lot of people would 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 do. And it's 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 so Again, I have no words. I don't even know how to express how I'm feeling about this. Um, and and then we have the last part, which is part eight, um, which is fighting back. Um, and there, he talks about his time as an advocate, and then when the people whose stories he has um, included in this book um, have escaped the country um, and, and shared their story, what happened to them. And just also just the way people try and get their story out. So I talked about um, that a lot of things are made with Uyghur slave labor. There was one person who had put a note in a vase or whatever that they made and so um, someone in the US I believe was had purchased that vase not knowing this and one day they were cleaning it and they found the note and they were like what and, and they were completely um, I didn't know what to do. Um, and just a few other creative ways to try and get their story out of there because you can't just escape China like that. I mean, Uyghurs can even be arrested for having a passport or a passport of just, just having been to a different country because why isn't China good enough for you? Um, so it's just... What we know is probably only the tip of the iceberg, which makes it even worse. Um, but the um, the author is is a known advocate for these things, and he's trying to or going to try to. Um, make like raise awareness about this ish these issues, and to do something about it. Then, uh, because that's the the thing that China fears the most that people know what they're doing. Um, so. Yeah, and there was a quote at the end in the, it was in the epilogue that I really liked, so I'm going to read it to you. The only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. That is why I will always speak up, even if it is through my own tears. Um, and that basically sums up that last part. Just making sure that as many people know about this as possible is already the first step in defeating the evil which is also why i'm making this very rambly and very um incoherent probably video um just because i wanna i don't have a platform like let's be honest i i 
I don't have like I have 10 subscribers I, I'm not gonna change the world with this video I know that but you know if if I do want to want to try and maybe there's one person who does have a platform who sees this video by some chance and spreads the message or something I don't know um because I do think that this is important and I know it's not my fight in the way that I don't want to be like the white savior um, in this, but I do want to support this and try and do whatever I can to support these people and help these people um, wherever I can. So that was this video, this very rambly video. I'll, I'll give you my thoughts on the book now. Uh, I, it's amazing. Um, just very important subject matter in the first place. Um, but also just very well written uh, and a very good book. I have only one critique um for it and that is that just structurally it was sometimes slightly messy um like for example in the war on weaker women we had a three stories and everything like jumps back and forth between them and the way it was done um felt a little messy at times um, or in another time where I just wanted to give you a quick overview of some political history of China and so did a timeline and I went through it and then I went to the beginning and then went through it again and I said oh yeah and at this time also this other thing happened and it just felt a little messy and a little clunky um, at times um, but that is my only critique of the book. Um, I gave it five stars. I recommend it to everyone. Trigger warnings, like all the trigger warnings, name one and it's in there. But yeah, it's 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 really good and really important as well. I there were a lot of important things in the book that I didn't mention in this video. Um, because it's already almost an hour long and I don't and there's a book that you can read um, if you want to know it all um, so I'm just gonna end it here um, so let me know your thoughts um, and I hope to potentially see you back in another video Bye.